Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, reading, writing, and banning children's books. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. About half of all American children are non-white. But until the last few years, children of color rarely saw themselves in the pages of children's books. And an increase in the number of authors, including authors of color, writing about the cultural lives of kids in color has resulted in a children's media slightly more diverse than adult content. Now that progress is threatened by a national book banning campaign targeting books by authors of color. What is the damage done by preventing these stories to be read? Joining us remotely, Jabari Asim, a professor at Emerson College and author of several children and adult books, including his most recent novel, Yonder. Mia Wingen, co-founder of Multicultural Children's Book Day and author of Books for Kids, including her picture book, Sumo Joe. Denise Aduce, a preschool founder and teacher and the co-founder of Latinx Pitch and Black Creators Headquarters. And Dr. Rujani LaRocca, author of many novels and picture books, including her award-winning book, Red, White, and Whole. Welcome to you all. So I want to start this way and have each of you uh, just a brief description of one of your many children's books. Let's start with you, Mia. Sumo okay. Joe, what's it about? So Sumo Joe, right here, um, <laughs> it's a rhyming picture book. And my intent was to show that Sumo wasn't... Um, uh, fat men and diapers. So to bring um, sort of dignity and respect to the sport, but also make it fun as a uh, sibling rivalry, Aikido versus Sumo. Oh, very, oh, very good. Um, Jabari. Uh, I'll talk about uh, my forthcoming children's book. It's called Me and Muhammad Ali, which comes out in September and is based on an actual encounter that my mother had with Muhammad Ali many years ago. So it's about a, a little boy getting to meet his hero, the heavyweight champion of the world. All right. Denise, your book's coming out in spring 2023? 20, yes. So my first book comes out next year. It's called Cesaria Wears No Shoes. It's about a deaf Afro-Brazilian child who wants to participate in Carnaval. Um, and she feels music through her feet and doesn't want to put on any shoes. Hmm. And Rujani. So my book, Red, White, and Whole, uh, is a novel in verse set in 1983. It's about a 13-year-old daughter of Indian immigrants who feels torn between the worlds of her parents and her friends at school and kind of American pop culture. But then her mother is diagnosed with leukemia and her world turns upside down. And she feels that she should just be the perfect daughter that she can somehow save her mother's life. So I think it's important for everybody to hear the rich diversity that you all are bringing uh, to this space of children's books. And that, of course, is the, is the point. Um, what inspired you to want to write the books that you have written to be in the children's book space? Jabari, I'll start with you. Sure, that's an easy one. My wife and I have five children. Uh, they're all grown now, but when they were uh, small, we were always looking for ways to entertain them. And Eventually, it occurred to me that I could be one of those sources of entertainment. So uh, several of my earliest children's books uh, arose from actual encounters with my children. Mm. Um, same question to you, Rujani. So uh, when I was a kid, I loved books. And um, I have been practicing medicine for a long time. And about 10 years ago, when I started looking into becoming creative again, um, I went back to writing uh, and I wanted to write children's books because the books that made the biggest difference in my life were the ones that I read as a kid. Okay, Denise. Sure, um, when I opened my preschool about 10 years ago, uh, my preschool is, look, uh, is located in Harlem. I promised that my library at my school would reflect and mirror the children in my Harlem community. 10 years ago, it was really difficult for me to do that and fulfill that promise. And so I decided to take it upon myself and write the books. And then in order to promote and support other black and Latino writers, I started Black Creators and also Latinx Pitch. But it was really as an educator, I want my children in my school to see themselves in books. 
Mia. So I'm 57. I grew up in Southern California. I read every book in my elementary school library. Um, and I never saw a character that looked like me. And, um, and then when I became a blogger, like 12 years ago, um, I saw a stat that the number of diverse books for children hadn't increased in 14 years. Um, and that's when I decided, you know, in my own way, I would do something about it. So let's pick up from there, uh, Mia. When did you see a book uh, that included somebody that looked like you? And more importantly, why is it important for people to understand why this space needs to include the stories that you all are telling? Um, so I think I, when my kids were born um, and young, I think my oldest is 22. I got a 19 year old and 17 year old. Um, when they were little, I was able to find books with Asian characters. And I thought, oh, this is great, you know, because it didn't exist when I was a child. And I just think kids need to see themselves reflected in a book so they don't feel marginalized. Because I know I, I, I couldn't even articulate it when I was in elementary school, but I always felt like, you know, maybe, you know, like, why is it like I never see anyone like myself in the media? You know, I must not be as important as white people. And how old, um, how old were you when you first saw one? I was a mother, so I was like in my 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's not just for uh, children of color to see themselves, but it's, you know, that whole windows, mirrors, and doors. Um, the only way to teach empathy is for all of us to read about other experiences. So it's just as important for white children to read about different experiences that they might not have encountered. Um, but, yeah, I, absolutely. Pick up on that, Jabari, if you would. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Mia's hit on something. One of, in my most cynical moments, I think that the way to defend these books that are uh, published by us and for us is to um, demonstrate to white people what's in it for them. What, what do they have to gain? Uh, to appeal to their self-interest as much as to their conscience uh, and to show that they are also denying their children access to empowering information by taking uh, books that feature uh, children and characters who look like we do uh, out of their children's hands. And how old were you when you first saw yourself in a book? Uh, uh, I think I was six. Uh, the book was called uh, Two is a Team by Gerald Beam. It was actually published in 1948. And between the publication of that book and the snowy day in the 60s, there's pretty much nothing uh, on the children's book uh, repertoire that reflects uh, children that look like me. So there was a huge, huge decades long uh, gap. Rajini? So uh, when I was a kid, I never saw myself or my own experience reflected in books, either in the US or in India when I visited my relatives. Uh, I didn't see my own experience reflected in a book until I was in my 30s or 40s. Uh, and when my children were little, uh, so they're half Indian and half uh, white, they never saw anybody like them in books. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to read about people who are not necessarily like them, um, largely because they usually find out that we are very much the same. We share a lot of values and a lot of um, things that we care about in the world. And just because we look different or come from a different background doesn't make us that different. So Denise, you get many, many little critics actually in your preschool. So what's the response? And I want you also to answer the question about when it was that you saw yourself and, and what it means in your classroom. Sure. So for me, the first time I think I saw something similar to me was when I read uh, the, uh, the Eyes of Watching God. Um, and that was very late in my education. Um, I think when we look at statistics, we know that when children see themselves in books, they engage more. Uh, it improves literacy rates. And so there are real reasons why we need to see ourselves in our books because that it improves their, their academic performance. Um, the way our kids our kids react uh, when when we read a story that has a they and the children see themselves they they tell you they're like that's me you know when we read Julian the story about Julian the mermaid there were so many little black boys in the classroom that just got so excited because that's them um, when we read books like Soul Food Sunday you know children who you know Winston 
uh, the author of this book is a member of Black Creators. Uh, children say, that's what we do on Sunday. We have we we eat together with our family. And so there's an excitement you hear from children when you when they see photo, they see the illustrations that look like them. Um, and and the other kids also who are not of, of, of the kids who are not of color in the classroom, they get excited too. This is the first time they've experienced a different culture. This is something new to them. And so for them, it it really does help them understand the children who are different from them and 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 also be able to live their experience through stories. All right, so now we are in a climate that is um, divisive is the the commerce word I can say. And a lot of attention has been turned to what uh, children are reading. Um, I would say young people to broaden that out, K through 12. And as it turns out, when we look at the list of books that parents would like to see removed from shelves or on the official banned book list, there are many of them, authors of color, or uh, books that have themes dealing with primary characters of color and or other marginalized communities like LGBTQ. I'd like to get your response to that and talk to me about the damage that's being done, Jabari. First, why do you think uh, the target is uh, at authors of color and this content, and what is the damage? I think it always comes down to a question of power. Uh, the dwindling majority wants to hold on to the power that has enabled them to unfairly oppress minority populations. And power and information are inextricably linked. So to take information out of the hands of young people is tantamount to removing them from access to power. And that the, the, the imbalance in power that has long characterized uh, the United States is able to continue. So it's, it's very... Um, it's, a, it's almost a, it's motivated by, by fear and greed, fear of a minority majority population and greed in terms of we want to hold on to the, the excess power, the disproportionate power that we've possessed all along. Rujini, do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, this is about fear on the part of adults. Uh, it is not children who are scared of these books. Um, it is uh, adults who are scared of facing the realities of the world that we live in. And uh, I agree with Jabari, it's 100% about power and fear mm -hmm. and trying to instill that fear and deny children access to books that are really beautiful and award-winning. Mia. So I would just say like damage, um, how successful were parents in banning rock and roll mm -hmm. and Elvis Presley? Like that worked real well. And right now you see um, banned book clubs. So when you try to prevent kids from reading, it becomes forbidden fruit. I had the experience myself, like when my daughter was 10 and I said, hey, could you just wait one or two years before reading Hunger Games? You know, it's a little violent. Mm -hmm. And I told my son in second grade, like, you know, your reading level isn't quite per Percy Jackson. Could we just like wait a year or two and just hang out in chapter books? Both of them went behind my back. They borrowed books from their friends. They read it halfway through. They reported, oh, no, mom, this is perfectly fine. You know, I got the book without your help. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then they went on. My son read every word Rick Riordan ever wrote. I mean, including like ebook onlys. Mm -hmm. um, and my mm -hmm. daughter read uh, dystopian books, um, other authors for six years. I mean, like that, that's still a genre she reads. So when you ban a book, you raise awareness, you give spotlight to it, it becomes more popular. Um, all of us who, um, and it's the minority who are trying to ban the book. So the majority then, you know, we, you know, we do our best to raise those books up. We buy those books, uh, we give those books away. Um, and then just the children themselves, they're like, oh, if I'm not supposed to read it, then <laughs> that's the book I'm going to get my hands on. Mm -hmm. and, and also ban uh, burning books, really? Like, you think that's the only way kids get books through a hard copy? So, you know, I mean, it maybe it worked like 100 years ago, but or 200 years ago, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get books. Um, and, you know, that's just kind of a sad way to go about it in terms of effectiveness. 
Well, I should also point out that you sent 500 copies of Sumo Joe to Texas, where a lot of this banning <laughs> and, and disinformation is going on, just to make sure that uh, mm -hmm. there was kids had access to your yeah, story. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, and you'll see authors, you know, uh, <laughs> rising to this challenge um, when we see this happening. We're just going to give away more and more books. I mean, that's what my nonprofit does. Mm -hmm. All right, Denise. <laughs> I, I agree with our speakers here. I think what we communicate to the kids um, when we're banning certain books is that certain kids' history, certain kids' culture um, and experiences are important and other kids are not. Um, and, and, it's, it's, and the kids get that message. I also agree with Mia is if you want a child to, to, to read a book, the best way to do it is ban it. I know um, in my house, if I, if I put a book out and I say, hey, I'm reading that, that's the first book my child's going to go grab, and then I can't find it anywhere in my house. Um, so it's 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 unfortunate that this is the message that we're sending to children. You're also sending the message to teachers that we don't trust your judgment, that we don't that you're even though you're on the ground and you're interacting with the kids and you know what their needs are and what's going on in their lives, we don't trust you to make a, a good decision about which books they should be reading. And so as teachers. And as an educator, we're very competent. We know our kids. We know what they're experiencing. We know that they learn how to deal with difficult situations sometimes by reading about it. And then they can, and their emotional learning and social emotional learning happens sometimes through reading. And then when they encounter those difficult situations, because they read about it, they know how to, how to interact with, with different situations. And I would add that, you know, teachers have been through unprecedented times with the pandemic. Um, and trying to teach in these circumstances. Um, you know, you see teachers leaving in droves and you're gonna add this to the, you know, list of things that teachers are being harassed about. You're gonna see more teachers leave. So the more you do this, pretty soon you're gonna find that your school district or your school is going to be unable to hire and retain teachers, especially the best teachers. So, I mean, it, it's just not like a winning strategy. Um, Jabari, are you worried that uh, this could have, uh, even though everything that you that you all have said about kids going for the banned book, you could end up with a chilling effect bo back at the source, meaning here you all are authors of color writing these books, but you can't get them published or you can't get the distribution that you want. Um, now, as, as you've pointed out, there are, and as I've said actually leading into this uh, segment, there are much more diverse content among children's media, but not all of it is produced by authors of color. Uh, so this could have a chilling impact on authors of color because it seems to me that as I look at the banned books, with some exception, mostly they're going after you all, not going after the writers who are writing about similar subject matter perhaps or having characters that are kids of color but who are not, uh, but who are white. So Jabari. Um. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think there are books, you know, one of the things they're concerned about is, is depictions of racism and racist history may make white students uncomfortable. But you make a, an important distinction. The books that they are finding guilty of this supposed uh, misdemeanor are books written by authors of color. If it happens to be uh, a white author who's addressing some of these same subjects, it's somehow less offensive. But I think you also point to larger issues. I mean, we, we're talking about uh, we have other people on this panel who are operating nonprofits and self-publishing, et cetera. This will become increasingly important because one of the things those of us who've been inside publishing for years have campaigned for is a greater percentage of um, editors, acquisition editors of color in decision-making positions. And in the 20 years that I've been publishing children's books, that needle has barely moved. And I do want to point out that my early books uh, my first three children's books were passed on by white editor after white editor after white editor. And it was two Asian American editors and one African American editor, all women who basically launched my career by acquiring books that white editors had passed on. Hmm. Denise. I think, you know, here at Black Creators and Kids that we're seeing, we're very, we're very excited how much the publishing industry has actually engaged our organizations. Um, we've held about 65 workshops in the past year and a half. Uh, we've, we've invited publishers to come and talk to us and we appreciate how proactive many publishers have been. There's, there's a wonderful, there's a lot of wonderful books that are in the pipeline, but we probably won't see them 
for two or three years. Um, for us, that's a signal. If you came to us and said, I want to engage your community, I'm looking for authentic voices, not stories written by, by people outside of these com of the communities that they're, they're writing about. Um, we appreciate that. But you, when you read a story, you can tell if it's written by someone from the community versus someone outside, because there's an authenticity um, that, that comes through. And there may be a perspective that some people do not want to hear about. And so it is much easier to read it if you're from the majority culture, to read a story that's written by someone who isn't actually experiencing racism and discrimination because it's not as it's it's not going to be as honest and how much it hurts. Um, and so I, I agree with Jabari that in the past, definitely we I I've had stories that were passed by, passed on. I had a I had a publisher tell me that if I changed my character to an animal, it would be more my brown child, my brown girl uh, character to an animal, it would be more universal. Mm. That hurt as an educator, as a, as a writer. And I, it took about a year to recover from that. Um, and, and I came back and I'm, and I'm not going to budge on that. My, my brown students are going to see themselves in books. Rojani. So uh, publishing is never easy. I don't think it will ever become easy, especially as a person of color. But I really do believe that this movement um, uh, looking for authentic voices, authentic, diverse voices, I don't think it's going away. It's certainly not going away in the writing community. There are a lot of us um, who are trying to get our stories out there and um, we're all encouraging each other. And I don't think it's going away in the publishing community either. I think that more publishers are looking for diverse voices. Now, that is not to say that ever, that anyone is gonna have an easy road. And what we need to do as readers and writers and members of the publishing world is to support each other and read each other's books and talk about each other's books um, and connect with educators and connect with parents. And so you know, that's, that's what I try to do uh, as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, being a person of color, not all of our stories are about pain and struggle. Exactly. We have plenty of stories about joy and, and love and connection. And those stories also need to be published and, you know, they are. And so I think that, um, you know, that's one thing that we have to be uh, careful about as, uh, you know, creators of color is to just make sure that people don't tell us what kind of stories we should write. We can write all kinds of stories and we are. Well, I have to underscore that because I think the assumption is that if it's written by one of you, we're about to be, uh, which is, what it says in some of this legislation, some of this banning, you're about to make other people uncomfortable and they don't want to be uncomfortable. So that's all you're writing about. Nobody knows that my favorite kid's book, little baby book is Jabari's, Jabari's Whose Knees Are These? I love that book. I've given it away <laughs> to a billion people. I've read it a whole bunch of, and it's just about a little baby and his knees and that's it. Right. <laughs> so I think there is much uh, more room to get that out and not be really sort of, um, um, uh, I don't even know what the word is, uh, put in a box about what kind of material each of you are writing and, and producing. Uh, Mia. Well, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, publishing is a business. It's all about dollars and cents. It's all about figuring out the trend and making money off that trend. And so, you know, they're going to they're gonna publish the books that make the most money. So if we can show and prove that, you know, minority perspectives can be bestsellers, can win major awards, like um, Rajani's book was a Newbery Honor Award, um, then they're going to make more of them. Because at the end of the day, you know, if editors don't publish books that make money, they lose their jobs. Is there... Um Anything to be said, you mentioned earlier, Mia, that um, uh, banning has increased interest in some books, and in fact, it's driven up sales of some books. Is there anything positive to be said about that phenomenon, um, Denise? Yes, sales increase because people are now curious, but there's an emotional toll on, on, on the writer and the creator. This is something they've poured their heart into, and you're telling them that this isn't something worth reading. And so we don't want to discourage our writers and our, and our illustrators and our writers. But um, when you're saying, is there, is there proof that 
books that are uh, that are written and created by people of color are selling well. Um, Soul Food Sunday, you can't find this mm. in Barnes and Nobles. You can't find th- th- this was released November sixteenth. It's gone into pr- it's gone. It's been reprinted a couple times. You can't find Soul Food Sunday if you try right now. They've and they're trying to reprint the book again. So that is, situations or um, instances like that shows you when when those books are written, they sell. Black Panther tells you mm. when those stories are told, they sell very well. And we're seeing that with Encanto. Mm. They do very well. That's and right. so if if the publishing industry wants it to repeat what Hollywood has experienced, please come see us at Black Creators and at Latinx Pitch. We have some stories for you. Um, you got 30 seconds, Jabari. Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the struggle continues, right? This is the, the earlier generations of, of creators of color uh, fought these same battles, had advances, setbacks. It's, it's somewhat cyclical, but I, I think it's going to continue. But for me, the bottom line, the struggles continue. And uh, those of us who are here to create will continue to create. Okay, great place to end. That's the end of our broadcast, end of our show. Thank you for joining us. And now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We are on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing our discussion on reading, writing, and banning children's books. So a question to all of you. Part of the authenticness of your stories, as you have written them, is also involves making sure you have an illustrator that can bring that authenticity to life on the page. So I'm wondering, have there been any struggles, What's the process by which you all have undergone to make certain that what you're writing is really well connected um, with what we're seeing on the page? Um, Let's start with you, Roginae. So uh, I am only a writer. I do not illustrate. The world is thankful that my illustrations don't (laughs) go anywhere. Uh, (laughs) But uh, the publisher is in charge of finding an illustrator for your book in general. And uh, with all the publishers that I have worked with, they always run the illustrator ideas by me, or they say, we're thinking of this person, what do you think? And I've been just incredibly fortunate to work with some amazing illustrators, and uh, some of whom are Indian, um, some of whom are not. And but uh, they as their art progresses, I get um, peeks at sketches as well. And I get to give input on that. But honestly, for the most part, the art director um, and my editor work with the illustrator um, directly and they have universally done a fantastic job. And that goes that is also true for the covers of novels. Um, The publisher finds an artist, and then they um, usually send me some options for covers, and I kind of choose between, you know, what, uh, between them about what I think might work best, and then they uh, go forward from there. I've been incredibly fortunate, um, and a lot of the uh, illustrators I work with have been Indian or Indian American, and uh, in those cases, when I have Indian characters in my story or Indian cultural elements, we've never had a problem. Mm. Um, Anybody had any problems? curious if there was any drama of your getting the illustrator or illustrations as to your liking um, to back up what you have on the page. I'm happy to share. I'm, okay. I'm actually really, I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the way it's turning out with for me. Um, my editor, I was feeling this way already, but my editor from Roaring Brook Press at Macmillan um, immediately insisted that since I have a deaf character in my book, that the illustrator be deaf Hmm. and be part of the deaf community. And so I was already thinking that and it made me so happy that she brought it up before I had to bring it up. Um, And so my illustrator is not only part of the deaf community, she's also Brazilian. 
Um, and so she's experienced Ghatam Laval as a deaf, as a person who's hard oh. of hearing. Um, and so for me, I'm just very happy that that was something that we were aligned on. And it was one of the reasons why I went with Varenbrook because I feel they, they do listen to their authors and their illustrators. And so there is room for creators to have that conversation about, I want it, I want it to be, I want the story to be authentic, both through the words, but also through the illustration. Mm. Um, but it's, it's not, it's a conversation that you do have to be comfortable speaking up and saying to your team that this is important to me. And I really, I feel like it's important that the community that I'm depicting in my story, not only feels the story, sees themselves, and it's authentic to their experience. Mm. I have a, I've had a similar experience. Mm. Uh, my, my editor now at, at Roaring Brook used to be at Little Brown. Uh, and this, this, was, this was the editor that... Uh, Launched the publication of Whose Knees Are These? Oh. Book that uh, that you talk. So so she paired me with the illustrator uh, Wen Pham. We did three uh, books together: uh, Whose Toes Are Those, Whose Knees Are These, and Girl of Mine. And when we were working on a uh, Boy of Mine, uh, Wen Pham, who's uh, Vietnamese American, said, "You know, I'm in the same situation that you're in. Um, my son doesn't see himself in books. How about we use a boy who looks like my son?" for the fourth book in the series, right? It wasn't my idea, it's mm -hmm. her idea. It's a brilliant idea. Um, and, and it was an instance in which uh, the editor paired uh, an illustrator of color and an author of color, and we were simpatico. Uh, we were able to make the project work. But that, that came from her, and I'm, and I'm grateful for her input. Wow, because uh, the reason I like whose knees are these, you can tell her this, it feels like you can <laughs> touch those little knees. They're so chubby. <laughs> uh, the illustrations are just so evocative. Mia. Yeah, she's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So I actually spent a lot of time searching um, illustration, like Instagram accounts, um, because I was realizing it's really hard to depict um, ethnicity, especially mm -hmm. Asians, especially if you don't make the eye a certain way. That's right. Um, and I had found um, a sumo illustration, two sumo illustrations, and I was like, oh my God, these are so great. Like, I wonder if there's another sumo book coming out. But I didn't realize that was the illustrator that my um, publishing company, Lee and Lowe, had already selected. And he was so excited, like he just like drew the, this like incredible, il two incredible illustrations and posted it publicly. Um, and I wasn't allowed to speak to him or inter oh. like they're very specific. Do not interact with him on social media, Mia, you know? Um, Why? Why, Mia? Completely. Why are you not allowed to? I, I don't it's, I think it's just like everyone needs their space. Oh, and see. so the illustrator doesn't need to hear the, you know what I mean? Like backseat driver from the mm -hmm. author. Um, and because, you know, the, the illustrator didn't do that to the writer. Mm. Um, but we became friends after the book came out. And, and then it, as it turns out, like um, Nat Iwata is also half Japanese like me. Uh, we both had family in Japanese internment camp experiences. And also just by weird um, happenstance, we both studied briefly Aikido. And mm. so it, it just sort of made like the whole book experience like a moment of like, oh my God, like, we're, you know. Um, and it, it, I think it also just having martial art experience and made him able to really depict action. Mm. Oh, that, yeah, that would, that would make sense. Um, now I don't, since I don't, not familiar with the world of illustrators, except for a couple of names that I might recognize, is it that at the same time, while there are more, we're, we're recognizing that there's not a flood, but there's a trickle, more authors of color writing these books. Are there more illustrators of color or are there maybe five to 10 and everybody knows who they are? Anybody can answer. I'm, happy, ahead, to, mm -hmm. I'm happy to go. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing more opportunity, but the same people are being tapped over and over again to illustrate. And so that delays when that book will be published. Mm -hmm. And part of it is not everyone... There are beautiful artists out there that, that depict wonderful images, but not everyone knows how to tell an illustrative story mm -hmm. and the visual story. And that in order to be able to tell an illustrative story or a visual story, you need to have experience. And so if in the past, many illustrators did, of color did not have opportunities, they now don't have the experience. Right. And so we do need publishers to be comfortable working with first time um, book, children's book illustrators and help and, and provide the mentoring 
um, for those illustrators so that way they gain that experience. We've had some wonderful publishers from Candlewick and other places who have come to Black creators and actually created mentorship programs with us and have mentored our, our, our illustrators at Black creators um, and also review their portfolio so they know how to sell and how to present their work on Instagram and other places on their website. So that way, uh, any art director that is looking at their online portfolio can tell that they can t they can do sequential art um, and that they can depict the story visually. And so part of it is one, one of the reasons that we have Black creators is that so that we can engage the publishing community and say, hey, we need your help uh, because of of historically people have been excluded. They don't have the experience. They have the talent, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. don't have the experience illustrating um, a, ch a children's book. Mm -hmm. So can you help us out? Great. Anybody else uh, want to So add? at Lee and Lowe, Sumo mm -hmm. Joe was a debut of, of multiple people. Oh. It was my debut picture book as an author. Now to Wada, it was the second book he illustrated, but the first book that came out as a picture book. And then also the graphic designer, which I didn't know until afterwards. That was her first book as well. And I believe she's also a person of color. Wow. So, yeah. So that, you know, a lot of um, firsts for all of us. Which mm -hmm. makes a huge difference when they're just a tiny number, as Denise has said. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. So my first picture that. book was oh, go ahead. also... I'm sorry, with... Roger. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, oh, please. Okay. My, my first picture book was also with Lee and Lowe, and the illustrator is um, Archana Srinivasan, who lives in India. So she's in the city where my entire family is from, which mm -hmm. I felt like it made it a very small world. Um, and it's uh, kind of set in ancient India and has, involves a math puzzle. Um, but then I have another book with a different publisher, Abrams, um, also illustrated by her called Where Three Oceans Meet. And it is a completely different kind of story, kind of a family story about a trip that a girl takes with her mom and grandmother. And her style is completely different too. And I feel like every time I turn around and we sell another book, there is another new South Asian illustrator that comes up. So it is an exciting time uh, to be a part of publishing because I feel like the new illustrators are, are coming out now too. Okay, Jabari. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that certain uh, publishers keep coming up in this conversation. And I think mm -hmm. it's important to note that too. Lee and Lowe founded by people of color, um, principally uh, an, an entry publisher for so many uh, celebrated authors and illustrators of color. Uh, Denise mentioned uh, Roaring Brook. There's editors at Roaring Brook. Candlewick is still a situation where informally we could put together a list of the, the 10 editors and publishers who are being most progressive in their approach to uh, illustrators and authors of color. And it's a small group of people. It's Lee and Lowe, it's Just Us Books, it's Roaring Brook, uh, it's, it's Hatch Hat. It's just a few places. And within those places, uh, well, just us and Lee and Lowe are, are, are run by people of color. Mm -hmm. But in those other places, there's a person of color who's in a decision-making position, who's making these acquisitions, who's hiring these illustrators. And that, to me, illustrates the fragility of the industry. Mm -hmm. If those people move yeah. or, if they leave, or if they leave the industry at those houses, we're often back to, to ground zero. Okay. And we're seeing, we're, we're definitely seeing that there are houses who have reached out to us and been very honest about we don't, historically, we haven't done a good job in this area. What can we do? And so being able to have those honest conversations about um, what is it in, in your previous experience with books that just didn't really represent our communities and how is it that we can interact with each other so that we're both educating one another um, about the situation um, I'm really grateful for what Chronicle has done in terms of uh, providing mentorship to to creators uh, black creators I've had a three-month mentorship with Melissa Manlove and it's been amazing uh, to, to work with a, an executive editor who sat down with me every week for three months mm. to talk through the, the industry and help me understand how to navigate, how to negotiate, how do I present my story and improve my storytelling. And so I think opportunities like that and, and publishers who are willing to take that time, um, it makes a difference in terms of the kind of stories they start, they start publishing. But I think you're also seeing white editors <laughs> who are sensitive, who are interested <laughs> and who are helping to bring authentic stories to mm. the market. Mm -hmm. Bryce Kendall. Yeah, my my imprint at Harper, the imprint I work with at Harper Collins, Quiltree Books is very committed to diverse voices, and uh, there's also Heart Drum, which is committed to Native voices, um, and they put out so many incredible books every year, and they are they are not going away, and that's with a 
major publisher. So I, I think that there's, you know, there's lots of hope and there's a lot of commitment um, even by big publishers uh, to diversity. So um, is there, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, responsibility, some action that you all, even though maybe it's not your particular book being banned, sort of have to take a stand as you're watching this happen across the country? And if so, how would you want to respond? Or do you think you should be responding? Some artists feel like I've done my work and that's my contribution um, against the tide and I don't need to do any more. I'm wondering where you all are. Anybody? I definitely think we all have a, we all have a responsibility. I could have, you know, when I got my opportunity, I could have just been comfortable with just anyone illustrating my story. Um, but I want to make opportunity. I want to make space for people who've had difficult time entering and who've been excluded. So the uh, individuals from the deaf community who haven't had opportunities to, to, cause maybe someone might feel like that's a difficult process. Um, if, if you're, if you can't sign, um, that we make opportunities for, for those individuals. I've appreciated authors like Chris Tebbets, who, who was a mentor for one of our critique groups for about six weeks. He's doing very well. Um, he doesn't have any responsibility to the black community, but came in and mentored a group of about six or seven writers over six weeks and read their manuscripts and gave them critique. Um, and, and so I think there are, there are ways that people within the writing community and beyond can support. Right now, Black Creators has an auction going on and you can donate or you can bid for an opportunity for an hour with an editor, wow. an hour with a, an art director, um, have someone critique your manuscript. And so participating in that auction or donating is a way that other indiv ind ind individuals can, can help other creators or black creators um, be able to improve their craft. Okay. I think open your wallet so I, if you can, and also um, use your platform. And it, you don't have to have you know, huge followings but you, but every little bit that you do, like each person could leave an Amazon review for a book that they like. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like, let's just raise, you know, all the creators and the banned books. Let's just raise their profile in big ways and little ways, um, what we can. And, you know, it, it all, it all helps. Yeah. I, I also think that um, it's important that we, uh, when we are in front of students and teachers that we talk about books uh, by diverse creators and, um, uh, you know, read them ourselves and then explain why we love them and why other people should read them. Um, of course, buy books if you can, check them out of the library, leave reviews, as Mia mentioned. Um, and honestly, um, in addition to mentoring other writers and other creatives in the community, we should keep writing. We should take up space because we are here, right? A literature needs to reflect the world around us, but we also help create the world that we want, right? We are a world full of all kinds of people from all kinds of places, and we should keep writing about that. I think as a reader, you can also make go to the library and keep asking for those books that are written mm. by people of color. Mm. The library market is one of the largest markets for, for publishers. And so if you go to the library and ask for Soul Food Sunday, if there's a long list of people wanting to read that book, those libraries are going to order that book. That's um, so go to your library, mm -hmm. say, I want that book by so-and-so, by this Black author, by this Latin uh, ex author of or Asian American author um, and request them as often as possible. Jabari, last word. I would, uh, I just wanted to say the librarians like the teachers that me and Denise celebrate. That's, they're our first line of defense and we owe so much to them and anything we can do. I mean, and they're under siege too. It's just yes. not uh, getting publicized as much, but anything we can do to strengthen our connections to them and to publicly acknowledge uh, our dependence on them and our gratitude toward them uh, for sustaining these books we need to do that as well. Well, I purchase and give them as gifts, and it's been so exciting. I now have new ones from all of you to give as gifts. It's so, been so exciting um, just to see all the new ones that come out, and my gifties have been delighted. So I thank you all for this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.